Hello, welcome back to our recorded lectures for HI-237. This is the Edge of the World, Scandinavian Exploration and Settlement on the Fringes of Europe. So as we've mentioned before, it is possible that prior to 800, uh, we saw seasonal occupation of defensible islands and so forth by Scandinavians abroad. Uh, certainly there would have been raiding. We've talked already about how the Annals of Ulster discussed laying waste to the islands in 794. Uh, but the shift towards permanent settlement comes after that point. Uh, saga tradition attributes the beginning of permanent settlement in the Isles to Harold Fairhair and his centralization of Norway. He supposedly drives regional rulers and their war bands into more distant exile, and some picked Orkney and Shetland as bases from which they could then attack Norway. Therefore, or so the uh, tradition goes, Harold took a fleet there and uh, intended to eliminate the threat and wound up making himself lord over Orkney as well. That is saga tradition. Uh, hence, take it with a mountain of salt, although there is likely some truth behind it all. Uh, the for first named Norse ruler of Orkney is Rogvald, Rongvald, and the saga says Harold gave Orkney to him because his son died there during the campaign against the pirates. More likely that Rongvald was the head of a uh, expedition, the success of which uh, would later bring him into conflict with Harold. But the person who really created the earldom of Orkney is Sigurd. Now in saga tradition, he's Rongvald's brother, and he converted the small scale Norse presence into a more organized regional lordship. And from there begins the conquest of Northern mainland Scotland. Uh, there is some suggestion in our sources that he made alliances with some of the local Scots lords, and even marriage alliances. We don't have hard evidence, but given how similar this is to behavior elsewhere, it's not difficult to see as plausible. Uh, Gaelic annals record what they call the wasting of Pickland towards the end of the 9th century, probably referring to what Sigurd was doing. But his success doesn't outlive him. Uh, the Scots push back, and even in Orkney, the Norse are being attacked by other Norse. It's also possible there was some conflict with the Danes, who are also trying to colonize. Think about similar conflicts going on in York and in England. Now, according to the sagas, there is a change in leadership. The bastard son of Rongvald, uh, Torf Einar, establishes himself on Shetland, gathers his forces, and becomes Lord of the Isles, displacing the Danes. So this is the root of Orkney's dominance in the 10th century. Now, did they displace the native population? I mean, certainly we see significant uh, Scandinavian place names, very few surviving non-Scandinavian place names, but it's much more likely that instead of displacement or geno genocide, um, that what we saw was cultural assimilation. Remember, colonized or conquered people like the Scots are very unlikely to look kindly on historical representatives of similar behavior. So the overblown approach of many earlier historians is understandable from that perspective. Really, they probably just learned to live with each other. That's how humans actually behave in such cases more often than not especially when they are culturally similar, as the uh, Scandinavians and the Scots definitely were. All right, so um, given that we were just talking about Orkney, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, Meishau, or Meishau. Uh, there's a very brief document in the reader on uh, runic inscriptions from Meishau. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on it. It is actually a Neolithic burial chamber dating back to about 3000 BC. It has an entrance tunnel aligned with sunset on the winter solstice. We know that it was visited by Vikings somewhere around 1150 CE, or AD rather. Um, they broke in through the roof, they left 33 runic inscriptions and eight sketches inside the chamber. Now the references to uh, Jerusalem fairers in the graffiti suggest an association with Rongvald's pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which is in the Orkney Inga saga. Uh, specifically, uh, Harold Maddardson and his men supposedly took shelter there. They called it Orkahaur, and two of the inscriptions mention that as well. 
Now, the tomb was opened by an amateur archaeologist in 1861, and the inscriptions caused a major stir because, I mean, it's the 19th century. These are Vikings. They are cool. Obviously, the problem was not just translating them, but also transliterating them. We've talked about the difficulty of runes before. Uh, there are plenty of hypotheses as to what the inscriptions mean, whether they were carved on a single visit or repeat visits. It was hotly debated for quite some time. Uh, one recent take that seems to make the most sense to me is that they are literally just fairly lighthearted graffiti. Do we take graffiti, literally? Uh, some of them are not inconsistent with other runic inscriptions elsewhere. You know, that so-and-so was here, so-and-so carved this. Uh, the runes are very homogenous, so it's unlikely that they were carved on multiple visits, or at the very least they were carved within a short period of time. And the rune types definitely suggest the mid-12th century. So there's no real reason to doubt the Sog evidence in this case. So northwest of the Shetlands, we are moving across the Atlantic here. Uh, we have the Faroe Islands, or the Sheep Islands as they're called. So these are 22 sizable islands with good places to beach Viking ships. They were likely discovered by the Vikings around 800 as they were exploring from the south. They would already have found, they would have found Irish monks already there, rather, uh, living in hermitages. Uh, they probably disrupted their happy, quiet lives of contemplation, but hey, it's not like they weren't used to it at this point. Uh, further on into the 9th century, more settlers arrived from Norway. This was very good grazing land, and it also offered uh, other opportunities like fishing. Uh, the settlement we know grew through the 9th century, probably uh, added to by uh, dissenters leaving Harold's Norway. Uh, but in general, the islands would have been a sufficient pole for the adventurers or the land hungry in and of themselves. There is actually a saga for the pharaohs, a Fatihar book, Flat Island book, from the 14th century. And it tells us that the first Viking settler was Grimer Kanbon, and that all modern pharaohies should claim descent from him. Uh, his name is a combination of Norse and Celtic elements. Uh, Grim is Norse, obviously. Cam is from an old Irish word for bent or crooked. Now, other saga evidence talks about Olaf Tryggvason's role in the conversion to Christianity of the Faroe Islands and the success of the settlements, but uh, it's not historically reliable, obviously. We do know that Christianity comes to the Pharaohs around 1000 uh, CE, likely through Olaf. Uh, the Pharaohs would have been an important waypoint stop between Norway and Iceland, so this is how a shipping route would eventually develop. Speaking of Iceland, it's the only sizable permanent Scandinavian settlement on land that did not have to be conquered. And the person who sums it up the best is the historian F. Donald Logan, because he calls Iceland the child that outgrew the parent. Iceland is best known for the literary achievements of its culture. Again, it was known by Irish hermits before it was settled by Scandinavians. The hermits just cannot catch a break. Uh, the discovery of Iceland is usually placed, uh, oh, by the Scandinavians rather, is usually placed at 860. They might have been there earlier, because uh, it does seem a bit late, given how much longer they'd been in the Faroes. Um, there are different versions of the story in the Landnama book about the discovery of Iceland. Uh, supposedly there were three expeditions uh, by Nadod, Gardar, and Floki. Uh, Nadod supposedly finds it by accident when a storm drives him off from the pharaohs. He liked it and called it Snowland. Gardar went looking for Snowland, and his mother, who was a seeress, insisted he do this. He found a natural harbor and built a home there. Uh, in the spring, he went home and said, Gardasholm is lovely. Floki went looking for Gardasholm, found it, and got so engrossed in fishing that no hay was made and all their livestock died over the winter. Uh, his group managed to survive, went home with a negative view of the place, and called it Iceland. Again, it's sagas, right? We've got to take it with a big grain of salt. So from what we've been able to tell, the bulk of immigration happened between 870 and 930, uh, where we have Scandinavians coming not just from uh, Norway, 
but also from the various Celtic lands. These are people who were men meaning to settle there, not explorers or seasonal visitors. And after 60 years, the immigration wave is pretty much over. I mean, communications continued with the old country, but the influx of settlers had ended. And Iceland was well on its way to becoming the only self-contained and independent overseas settlement. So Ari Thorgilson, Thorgilson wrote the Islandiga book around 1125. Um, now, admittedly, it's written much later than the wave of immigration, but we cannot exclude the importance of the oral tradition. Uh, Ari himself also had connections to important people within Iceland, and he describes uh, a version of the settlement. The other major work that does is, of course, the Landnama book. Um, it was probably written down in around the 12th century, but we have only 13th century or later editions. It's sort of a catalog of early settlers and where they come from, some of their genealogy, stories about their deeds. Neither of these uh, documents can be taken wholly as uh, at face value or as completely accurate, but they do provide a lot of detail. Uh, they tell us, for instance, that settlers often circumnavigated the island before they decided where they would settle and that they made a habit of casting their high seat pillars overboard to see where they should land. These are sort of like door frames, and when they're actually installed in the house, they're sort of like a, a frame within which the seat of the man of the house would be located. It was a way of representing patriarchal authority. Uh, we're told that settlers could only claim the land that they and their men could carry fire around in one day, and that he would have to distribute land to his followers after settlement. So he establishes himself as a local lord and then gives out land. Uh, we do know that settlers came with slaves, and some of these slaves would have been from Ireland and Scotland. Uh, likely there were some Irish amongst the settlers as well, but they probably would have been wives rather than the men of the house. Uh, our sources suggest about 400 settlers, but what that actually means is 400 chief men with their families and retinues probably much more like uh, somewhere between 10,000 and 60,000 actual people. And uh, traditionally, Icelandic settlers were said to number a lot of political exiles, uh, Harold again. Uh, but when you look closely, it seems like Harold was actually probably supporting the settlement, or at least trying to control it. Uh, he limited the amount of land each settler could take. He put a head tax on those emigrating from Norway. You don't have to be in exile to be drawn to the opportunities in Iceland. And let's close out with Greenland. So the first recorded sighting of Greenland was around 900 by a ship lost in a storm. Uh, Gunbjorn sails west when the sea calms and spots Greenland, plus some of the coastal islands, and they were given his name on maps for a time. Greenland is definitely known about in Iceland during the settlement period, and it was the next option for those who wanted more land after Iceland had been divvied up. Eric the Red, the driving force behind all of this, uh, sagas tell us that he and his father fled Norway, came to Iceland, and found only marginal lands available around 970. Uh, they were apparently feuding with their neighbors, and Eric was outlawed for three years as a result of the bloodshed. So he goes west to explore. Uh, he didn't find the eastern coast inviting, so he goes south following the coast, and in the southwest finds land that's more appealing on the fjords. He thinks it's very reminiscent of Norway. Uh, he spends those three years exploring and decides that there are two potentially good spots for settlement. Uh, one was the place he'd found in the southwest, another was further north by about 400 miles. He's become known as the Eastern and Western Settlements. The saga claims he named it Greenland to entice settlers, but uh, probably the climate was warmer uh, than today. Uh, he founded the first settlement in around 985. Uh, the Eastern Settlement had about 190 farms at its height. The Western had about 90. Uh, Christianity uh, comes to Greenland around 1,000. We know that Eric himself converted, although his wife apparently did so first and then refused to live with him if he stayed a pagan. 
Uh, there's actually a bishop's diocese established in 1126 and a monastery and nunnery in the 12th century. We have plenty of sources for the settlement. Uh, papal letters, there are bishops of Gardar who show up at ecumenical councils, there are sagas, there are stories about ships and polar bears being given as royal gifts at European courts, and uh, constant excavations in Greenland have added a lot of archaeological evidence. They've even found Eric's farm, uh, a cemetery nearby, the church of Eric's wife, the cathedral at Gardar, and the bishop's palace, all of which have had plenty of artifacts. The ice cover even preserved a cemetery at the eastern settlement down to the clothing the bodies were wearing. And uh, everything that we have tells us they live very similarly to the Icelanders. Now, in contrast, however, what ended the settlement is still a puzzle. Uh, by 1500, it had effectively ceased to exist. Uh, there are no witnesses and uh, no contemporary explanations. So all we really have are theories. Theory one, climate change. Uh, the Little Ice Age, basically. Uh, the ice comes further south, it chokes off the shipping lanes, brings the native south following the s native south following the seals. We do have some evidence for conflict between the two groups, so this is plausible. We also have uh, political or economic factors. Might have been the kings of Norway trying to control the place too much. Uh, and certainly in the 13th century, uh, the Norwegian kings restricted Greenland's trade. Uh, cut down on its exports and imports, both of which were vitally necessary because they didn't produce a lot of themselves. Uh, it's a bit debatable because, uh, you know, how much of its trade would really uh, have been dependent on Norway? And then, of course, you have potential conflict with the locals as well. So we're not sure. Um, it's not covered in our sources. It is a bit of a mystery. So that's kind of a, a quick sort of uh, journey in the footsteps of the Vikings as they moved into the uh, the northern seas. Um, you've got some interesting readings to do for Tuesday, and I'll be uh, intrigued to hear what you think of them. Thanks very much, guys, and have a good rest of the weekend.